Hey guys, I'm Fowler. Today we're talking sub separation. I think a lot of producers use this, but they may not be using it in the best possible way. So today I'm gonna give you my take on it. Here we go. Okay, so the first thing we gotta talk about is harmonics, which means we're gonna get a little mathy, we're gonna get into the physics just a little bit, nothing too serious, but we gotta do it if we want better bottom ends. Everything you hear Every waveform, no matter how complex it is, can be broken down into individual sine waves of different frequencies, amplitudes, and phase. That means, you know, the sound of a sawtooth or even the sound of a car driving by. It's all very complex addition of sine waves added together because a sine wave is a waveform with only one frequency. It is the, the building blocks of every sound you ever hear. So I've created this patch and phase plant I've turned off all of the oscillators, all of the oscillator, oscillators. Why can't I say oscillators? I've turned off all of the oscillators except one, which is a sine wave. Right now I'm playing it at E and you can see it on the oscilloscope. You can see that there's only one frequency on the spectrogram. I'm going to now start turning on more of these harmonics. So the first one is an octave up or twice the frequency, but it's half the amplitude. Now I'll get into that a little bit later, but for now, this is what we get. You can see, okay, the waveform has become a little more complex. We've added a, a harmonic or a frequency in the spectrogram. So let's keep adding. Okay. That's three times the frequency. That's four times. So I've basically added all of these harmonics that I've strategically chosen to build a sawtooth waveform, or at least an approximation, because in reality, in order to get a perfect sawtooth, we would have infinite frequencies all the way up to infinite Hertz, right? But this is, this is an approximation. And you can see in the oscilloscope that it's a pretty close approximation. You can tell that we're missing some of that real crispiness, and that's because I haven't added all of those higher frequencies. That's where the crispiness comes from. That's how we get from the bottom of the sawtooth up to the top almost instantaneously. We need a lot of high frequencies to do that, and I've only added 15 because I didn't want to be here all day adding oscillators to phase plan. Now we can see that in order to create a sawtooth, We've added 15 sine waves together at different frequencies at different levels. Just for you math nerds out there, the formula for a sawtooth is you add every harmonic, even and odd, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and every time you add a harmonic, you take the reciprocal of the frequency and that's what you use for an amplitude. So for example, this second harmonic, which is twice the frequency, gets halved. This third harmonic, that's three times the frequency gets divided by three, which is a third, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how you build a sawtooth. Now for another quick example, I've created uh, the equivalent for the square as well. So this is what it looks like full frequency. Now the difference is we're only using odd harmonics. That's what the difference between a square wave and a sawtooth wave is. Sawtooth has even and odd, square only has odd. So now I'll go through and I'll build it back up from the fundamental frequency, which is the bottom frequency. We've got the sine wave. Let's start adding harmonics and you'll see how the waveform evolves. You'll notice that as I'm adding those higher frequencies, that edge is getting sharper and sharper, which is a high frequency to be able to go from the bottom to the top really quickly. Anything that's really quick is a high frequency. So that's why the more higher frequencies you add, the sharper that edge gets and the more square wave it looks, right? Hopefully this has shown you that complex waveforms and sounds are just a bunch of sine waves added together. So in order to talk about how this applies to sub-separation, let's talk about why we do sub-separation to begin with. The problem we're trying to solve is as we create more complex waveforms and you know interesting sounding basses, we usually introduce unison, chorus, you know, detuning, all kinds of stuff that add that extra character on top, but it messes with the bottom end. For example, I've brought this down to just a sine wave. I'm gonna add unison. So you can see that as I add unison, which is two of the same sine waves, but just spread out a little bit in pitch, the phase starts to cancel out 
periodically. That could be cool. Maybe that's what you're going for. But if you want a solid bottom end, you're, that's going to make the bottom end come in and out of amplitude. So the, the, the volume of it is going to kind of sporadically change loud and quiet, loud and quiet. You know, it's more than likely going, going to be related to the, the frequency. So it might not even go with the tempo of the song. We don't want that. We want to be able to have the coolness of the evolving phasey kind of complexity that we're creating. We want to have that in the top end, but we want to have a solid sub range that maintains that girthy bottom end, you know, that powerful bottom end. The solution we've come up with is to separate the complexity of the cool sounding bass wubs into one channel or one signal path and then create the sub range in a more simple, easy to control signal path, and then combine them together, hopefully in a way that isn't obvious that you've separated those two things. It's just kind of sounds superhuman, like, wow, it has all kinds of complexity, but it also has a solid bottom end, right? So that's what we're trying to achieve. The problem that I find a lot of people have with this is knowing where to separate the sub bass and the complexity bass, or the character bass, as you might call it, the top bass, the mid bass, the growl, whatever you want to call it. A lot of people will throw out a number. Maybe, oh, you always separate your basses at 200 hertz or 100 hertz or whatever. That is a very vague and unscientific way of doing it because the reality is, the frequency that you pick is really dependent on what notes you're playing, right? If we want to cut off the bottom end of something, we need to know where that bottom end is. And just saying always cut at 200 hertz, that's where a lot of people screw up. That's That may be too high, it may be too low. So let's, let's look at an example. So I've loaded up a patch I made years ago. Um, it's called Damn. And you can see that it's very complex. There's a lot of interesting movement happening. There's some rhythmic stuff happening. But you can tell by these alternating pulses is in the spectrogram that the bottom end is not solid. We can also tell that the fundamental frequency is around uh, 42 Hertz. That's the frequency of an E, which is the note I'm playing. Now what we wanna do is remove that bottom end. So the way that I choose where to do the separating between the complex bass and the sub bass, it's not some magic number or anything like that. I have to know what notes are being played in the song because that's gonna determine how, uh, what, what frequency range we're playing with. Um, so I clicked in some semi-random notes here. You can see them. Uh, You basically have to look at your song. You have to look at what the highest note you're playing is. The highest note that we're playing is a G. So let's play a G on the keyboard. And we can see that the fundamental frequency of that G is right around 50 Hertz. So I'm going to do a very steep high pass and I'm gonna bring it up. Okay, so now if you look at the spectrogram, when I play that G, it has totally gotten rid of that bottom frequency. Now let's play the bottom note we're playing. So the bottom note we're playing is a D, which is down there, right? If I play that D, we can see it's starting to touch the second harmonic, which was the second frequency up from the bottom. So it's it, that this is where the kind of the choice comes in. And you have to make a compromise unless you do some more creative stuff. Like maybe, you know, you could automate this high pass to move with the notes that are playing. So you're always, no matter what note you play, you could have this set to move with the note to always cut that bottom end out. You can also sometimes do some interesting stuff in here. You know, you could lose this bottom frequency or something. I rarely will do that. But what I've done now is I've chosen a strategic frequency to cut this off at. And I know that I've dropped that fundamental sine wave off of that sound. So now we have a clean slate down in the bottom end. We don't have any energy. We don't have any uh, noise or very little in the sub range, which means we can go and replace that with something solid. So let's copy these notes. We're gonna make this unique 
and I'm going to insert, let's just, now let's stick with serum. That's not serum. There's a few different ways to do sub bases. I'm gonna start by showing you just the sine wave, which is as, pretty much as basic as it can get, right? So let's send this to its own channel. Let's play, uh, let's, let's turn off the complex bass and start playing the sub bass. Now I'm basically doing the same thing with the low pass for the sub bass as I did with the high pass for the complex bass. Now you could set that to the exact same frequency, but I like to leave a little bit of overlap because if you get the interaction between the sub bass and the complex bass up in the higher harmonics, it's not such a big deal because that's not what's supplying that bass, that sub. The sub is really just the fundamental frequency, so the very bottom end. I actually kind of like to have a little bit of interaction between the sub bass and the bass sound because I feel like it adds some connective tissue between the two. But for now, we're just gonna stick with this. Now let's play the highest note, which is the G, and let's make sure that's coming through full blast. Okay, lowest note. All right, so now what we've done is we've taken this complex bass, we've surgically and strategically cut off the bottom end at a frequency that makes sense to the song we're writing, not just because somebody on a forum somewhere said that you gotta cut it off at a certain frequency, we're actually being scientific and smart about it and cutting it off at the right frequency. And now we're adding that sub bass back in with the sine wave. Now that's the very basic sub separation technique that I use. Sometimes I like to, instead of starting with a sine wave, I'll start with a square wave. What this will allow us to do is, we'll, we'll bring the low pass way down. And what, what this is doing is allowing us to create that connective tissue. The way I look at it is, I don't want it to sound like a sub bass and a complex bass. I want it to sound like a complex bass that has a good bottom end, right? I want it to sound like one cohesive package. So what I'll do is I'll allow some spill of the higher frequencies over in to the complex bass from the sub bass. And there you have it. What we've done is we've taken a very complex and phasey sound, and you can see it in the spectrogram. That that is with the sub bass separation. Let's turn the sub bass separation off. And so without the sub bass, you can see that the bottom end is not solid. If we just straight up add the sub bass on top of that without any sort of high passing or separation, you can see that we still have some high and low spots fading in and out in the bottom end, and that will cause some moments of the song or some, you know, in between beats to be loud and other be quiet, and it's just not as stable and like mm, in your face, right? And now we can do whatever we want with this. We can, you know. We can get all crazy, we can have it phasing in and out, we can have all kinds of like crazy sounding effects and whatnot on that bass, and we know that we're not affecting the bottom end, and that's the whole point of this. So there you go, guys. I hope that my slightly more scientific approach to sub-bass separation will help you in your production, um, help you get that better bottom end, because we all want that better bottom end. I love making this content for you guys. I love helping share knowledge. If you have any suggestions for future content, let me know in the comments. If you found this particularly useful or found one part of it particularly useful, let me know. I love hearing from you guys, so I'll see you in the comment section.